And um, another role that you serve is the chair of the Black Caucus. And of course, um, I want you to give a little bit of insight into the Black Caucus. And that's because, you know, we, we hear about caucuses. We hear this term, we know there's a Black Caucus, a Latino Caucus, a Progressive Caucus. Um, but give us a little bit of background um, on the Black Caucus, the makeup, and maybe the overall purpose of the Black Caucus? Well, currently the Black Caucus has uh, 20 members. Uh, there are 18 African-American wards, but there are 20 Black aldermen. Mm -hmm. So we have 20 members in our caucus. The two members that represent majority wards are Matt Martin and Maria Haddon, who have wards on the north side, the 47th mm -hmm. and the 49th ward. Mm -hmm. But the balance of us represent predominantly African-American wards on the south and west sides of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Our primary purpose is to work uh, as a unit for the betterment uh, of the communities in which we serve. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we are all, all on one accord. Sometimes we may take a, a difference mm -hmm. of, a, of opinion on things, but the primary goal that we have as it relates to major legislation is to find common ground and to advocate for the benefit and the interest of the black communities on the south and west side of Chicago. Okay. And I know that you all um, also are very, you know, not only do that, I know that you're actively engaged in the community in sorts as well, because um, it's, in addition to the legislation, you all also uh, work with the community on things. And you talk about some of the things that you all do, particularly in the way of students. I know that you all are big on education as well. Well, one of the major uh, things that the caucus does, our foundation is to provide scholarships uh, for our children uh, in the black community on the south and west sides of Chicago. Uh, in the past year, uh, we've awarded over $100,000 in scholarships to uh, individuals in our communities. In the past, we had gone from a system of doing a $2,500 a year uh, annual scholarship to making them actually uh, $10,000 renewable scholarships because we felt that, you know, you give someone an opportunity for one year, but what happens in year two, they still need that support. Mm -hmm. So as long as the, uh, as the uh, students keep a 3.0 GPA, mm -hmm. remain full-time students, we have renewed those scholarships and we will renew them up to four years. So mm -hmm. hence we have a, a $10,000 scholarship for every one of our scholarship recipients because we truly believe that if it were not for the education and the solid foundation that we receive, not only politically, but in the classroom, we would not be where we are today. So we want to stress the importance of our young people getting that in education. Sometimes it may be in college, other times it may be in trade school, but we want to support uh, our residents and support our young people on the south and west sides of Chicago. All right. Well, I think that's great um, for us to know. I think that uh, so many people, you know, we hear these terms thrown out but maybe you don't have the opportunity to speak directly and learn more about it. And so one of, this has been, of course, a, a trying year. Of course, with recent events, there are a lot of things that we want to cover, get your insight uh, to um, uh, as well. But one of the things I'll start in just asking you uh, is um, just talk a little bit about the role and responsibility of an alderman. And I ask you this because many people, they see news clips and see things, but they may not really understand how much uh, you all do or really the roles of an alderman. And like I said, I know that you all filled a lot of calls from the community, but just give an oversight into some of your responsibilities as an alderman in the city of Chicago. Well, well, statutorily, uh, I am a legislator, meaning that just like your member of Congress, your, your state representative, your state senator, I am a city legislator. That is statutorily my primary responsibility. Now, what I do is totally different from what my statutory responsibility is because through time, uh, the alderman has been called on to do a myriad of things um, in the community. So in some respects, I, I view our role as quasi-executive and legislative because there are some things that we do uh, that traditionally that you would see in most forms of government done by the executive branch, uh, but generally uh, they all end up coming through the city council. Believe it or not, the city of Chicago's council is designed to be a strong council, weak mayor form of government, but in, in many cases people will view it as the exact opposite. 
But again, uh, overall, when we look at, think about legislation, we talk about ordinances or laws that are passed by the city of Chicago. Those items uh, originating generally come from the Chicago City Council, of which there are 50 aldermen, uh, 50 wards. And you got to remember in the past, there were two aldermen per ward, but uh, sometime back in the early 1900s, uh, that was changed to having one alderman uh, per ward. And so primarily as a, as a legislator, we, we've got four major responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Number one, as I said, is to legislate, mm -hmm. uh, which is the act of uh, passing uh, laws and uh, creating ordinances and, and the like. Mm -hmm. The other portion which we just came out of was is to appropriate, mm -hmm. which means that we're going to uh, appropriate dollars for pre uh, programs that the executive branch, which is the mayor, uh, spends and, and has control over. Mm -hmm. The third thing is to investigate which is another function that's going on uh, amongst members of the council right now, mm -hmm. as we uh, have been talking about this case amongst uh, mm -hmm. Anjanette Young and, right. and the situation that she encountered. So we're actively involved in looking at that and investigating that matter. Mm -hmm. And the fourth thing that we do, we're advocates and that we advocate. We advocate mm -hmm. for our constituency. And that's where really the, the caucus comes in because we are, you know, generally advocating for the interests of black folks on the south and west sides of Chicago. So those are the four things that we do as aldermen. And sometimes that, that spills over into different types of ways that we do it. But when you look at what we do, it, it falls under those four banners because we're always advocating for our residents, be it for services, uh, be it for specific types of resources. So all of these things kind of work in and go together under those four banners of what our roles and responsibility truly are. Okay, I appreciate that breakdown. And one of the things, you, you, you hit on a few things that'll lead into some of our other topics of conversation, particularly about uh, Sister Anjanette Young and her experience and uh, you know the aftermath of that, what we're, the investigative portion of it. Also, um, as far as the city budget, now, there's a lot of discussion back and forth on the budget you all were able to vote and approve when we want to go into that but you also talked about um the black caucus a as a whole you know and it makes up the south and west sides and you mentioned you know sometimes everyone may not agree on everything and uh, we're seeing that more but you know we do uh, make a, we do have a, a very diverse community within the black community and so that's to be expected but um just talk a little bit about um, what this year has been like for the Black Caucus, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disproportionately affected our communities. Of course, uh, not only from a health standpoint, but when you look at the economic impact and things of that sort, and then the overall responsibility. I know in the budget, you know, you fight hard to allocate and appropriate funds specifically uh, to the communities that are in need, uh, but just talk about the challenges that this year uh, that you all faced as a caucus in trying to align and, um, and advocate for the community. The biggest challenge that COVID brought to us, not only from a health, health perspective, mm -hmm. was that the city lost a, a tremendous amount of revenue uh, mm -hmm. that it would normally have had uh, during this same period of time. I believe the number has been pegged somewhere around 700 to 800 million dollars and just annual traditional revenue that the city has lost. And when you start losing revenue like that, the first thing that people look to do is to begin to cut programming, cut spending, uh, cut employment, uh, things of that nature. And so our job from jump was very difficult, not out, just outside of the health issue, the fact that you have people in the community uh, dying that you know, people are contracting this disease, people are not listening. Uh, when this first started, it was just like, oh, you know, this this is this would be all right, we'll be done in a minute and, and, and it won't be a big deal. But when people, you you know, started catching the virus, seeing the effects of the virus, you know, I know some folks, they still don't have the smell and taste uh, in their mouth and they've, they've been, you know, technically virus free for four or five months. Yes, so when, when people really didn't uh, truly on the first end understand uh, what was happening, we still had people congregating as if it were just regular, you know, regular business. And until, you know, you started seeing the deaths in the community, 
you know, some people are like, well, wait a minute, we really have to, you know, think about this and think about what we're doing. And it's been a challenge getting that information and communicating that information and to get people, especially some of our younger folks to listen to it. Now, on the other hand, some of my seniors, you're not, you go to talk to them and that's as far as you're going to get is the telephone because they're not taking any visitors. They're not taking anything because, you know, many of them have underlying health conditions and they're like, Hey, I, I'm, this is serious. I do not want to find myself in the hospital or find myself, you know, uh, even worse, uh, dying uh, right. from this particular disease. So we've had that, that challenge, number one, on the health side and get into resources for testing, uh, resources for, for treatment, uh, when you look at the testing sites and, you know, again, uh, thanks to our members in the General Assembly, uh, we've been fighting and working to get testing sites on the south and west sides of Chicago mm -hmm. so that our people can get tested uh, and, and find out what their status is and also bring in the resources for those that, you know, have to may not have the ability to you tell someone that, hey, you use this bathroom and I use the other bathroom. Well, hell, some people in their house, they only have one bathroom. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, you know, multi-generational uh, families uh, living together. And so a lot of the stuff that they were given the main stream communities, you know, in some respects, you know, we had a little different situation. So we had to provide and bring additional resources to the table to help those that couldn't social distance in, in their home, for those that couldn't go to a uh, have a, a separate bathroom in their home or couldn't go in the basement and quarantine while the rest of the family was upstairs, you know, doing something different. So there was it was a big challenge for us once this thing really hit in. But one thing I, I do want to say, I do want to, you know, thank the, the federal government for the resources that they brought to the table for that in the COVID in the first wave of the COVID relief. The biggest challenge that we saw as a city, though, was the fact that there was not the necessary revenue replacement uh, that was needed to kind of really keep us whole and keep us together. But we did at least be were able to get people treated, get people tested and continue that fight. And then especially amongst our homeless uh, populations and the other populations that, that have special needs and special challenges, you know, at least the federal federal funds that we received, we were able to help. I have a large number of homeless beds in, in, in the 28th Ward on the west side of Chicago. And, you know, we were adequately able to service some of those individuals through a safe haven. We had another small place where we had a, a, a COVID outbreak. But again, with the necessary resource, we were able to bring, a, bring that situation under control and actually, you know, adequately uh, help those individuals. So the biggest challenges, you know, on the health side have, have been one thing, but it's really been an economic impact. Now we talk about folks that have lost their jobs, a lot of people in the service industries, a lot of people that work in restaurants where basically the restaurant is closed. Well, if it's closed, you can't go to work. And then fighting to help people with their unemployment and making sure that they get their uh, necessary funds on a weekly basis and getting them recertified and going through those steps and those processes. So again, this has been a tough uh, goal for a lot of people, especially in our communities. And now we have to deal with the housing crisis that we will see behind this because while the moratoriums are in place currently, uh, if you haven't been able to pay your, your bills and haven't been able to pay your rent uh, for the last six, seven months, the only thing that's keeping you in your home today is, is you know, Governor Pritzker's pen uh, with the moratorium. Mm -hmm. But we know that these things will come to an end. So it is our hope and desire that between the state and federal government that relief will be provided uh, for these residents and relief will be provided for these landlords so that you know everyone can can be whole out of this mm -hmm. this was something that uh, no one predicted uh, no one necessarily saw coming mm -hmm. but now that we're here we have to do the best that we can with the situation yes sir yeah you spoke a lot and it, it has um been a challenge and it looks to continue to be a challenge because although the vaccine um vaccines have been released of course um, it's still in the early stages and um, it hasn't really um, matriculated out to the community yet. Um, and and it, it is too early to tell, but we know that the impact will go well into 2021. So I know that you all um, continue to have your hands full with that and trying to legislate and advocate and make sure that resources are available. And speaking, and let's talk about the vaccine. You know, people have have concerns about the vaccine, mm -hmm. about its uh, effectiveness and, and about its 
you know, experimental nature because of the historic mm -hmm. things that have happened to our community over the over the test of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one thing that I will, will say is that we really have to, you know, encourage people to become vaccinated mm -hmm. because if, if we do not vaccinate ourselves, we run the risk of either, either further mm -hmm. loss of life, mm -hmm. uh, further economic instability because our folks are unable to to work and you know if the vaccine once i'm you know eligible mm -hmm. to uh take part i i intend to get the vaccine mm -hmm. uh because i i do want people to get vaccinated because even if we are vaccinated that does not eradicate this disease it just helps us to manage it it doesn't eradicate it so mm -hmm. i think we have to be very careful uh in the messaging and, and getting individuals mm -hmm. and, and studying the side effects studying what's going to happen because i know there are some people that do not trust the vaccine and may not trust the federal government you know again based on valid historical information yeah. but i think that we all have to band together and, mm -hmm. and do what's best for the most of us in these communities especially our, our, our seniors mm -hmm. and those that have underlying conditions yeah. and i'm glad you said that because it's true there is um a, a huge um uh, there's hesitance, you know, reluctance, and people who may not, you know, even um, believe in vaccines, you know, they don't want to be vaccinated That's based true. on our history and things that have happened. And um, and you have to give credence to that, not only from a historical nature, but when you look at uh, this, uh, this pandemic and how uh, the information has continued to shift and change because there's so many unknown things. And I think that the key will be transparency into the effectiveness of the vaccine, the side effects on a, on a large scale, and, you know, educate people with the most information so they can make the decisions for themselves. And so no, I agree with you 100 yeah. percent on that. There's nothing foolproof here with anything. So mm -hmm. I think it's best to, that that everyone is transparent. The government is transparent. Mm -hmm. The doctors are transparent and letting people know what it, what it is and what it isn't. And, you know, in nothing is, as I say, 100 percent effective, 100 percent foolproof. So it is incumbent upon us to to honestly, you know, take a look at this and, and do what we believe is best for our, our family, for our children and for our seniors. OK, you know, Alderman, before we go to um, take a call, I want to go um, delve and transition into the uh, case of Miss Anjanette Young and, you know, um, of course, when I believe it was CBS 2 News aired the story um, and I saw it in the newspaper, got garnered a lot of reaction. Um, you know, um, the community, of course, has been heavily engaged. There was some messaging that came out, of course, uh, from the mayor. And I know that um, the Black Caucus, I know you specifically uh, requested the, um, the IG to um, investigate as well. Uh, so talk to me about... Uh, when you first saw the video or you come to understand uh, when you learned about the situation, what was your initial reaction? And then what transpired to um, ask to cause you to ask for um, the um, the IG to investigate? Well, it, it, there was there were several incidents. Uh, Anjanette Young was one of several uh, situations where members of the Chicago Police Department, uh, for whatever reason, uh, were not in the proper places executing these search warrants. Mm -hmm. So that was point number one. I think, the, I think the real key that turned a lot of us is when uh, we watched, there was a documentary that um, CBS did and it talked about the children's uh, tra trauma and impact uh, that was had with these, uh, with these raids on top of what happened to Anjanette Young, uh, you know, really kind of crystallized that there is something wrong uh, with this process. And it, you know, caused me, it caused other members of the council to begin to dig into well, why is this happening? We understand, you know, anything can happen once, maybe twice. When we start seeing, you know, patterns in, in repetition on these situations, there's something systemically wrong that needs to be addressed. Now, to the police department's credit, they have made adjustments uh, since these uh, incidents have occurred. Right. The challenge is they never told anybody what they did. 
And I think, it, you know, as us as, as legislators and, and in, you know, now investigators, that we need to understand how did you all, A, get, get to a point where this, this was happening, and B, what have you done to fix it? And, and if what you did to fix it was enough. So right now we are looking at those, the aftermath of this, but to sit down and watch uh, children cry. When I, I looked at a young, uh, and I'll never forget this child's name. Her name was Daviana. Mm -hmm. And a three-year-old talk about how police pointed guns at her and threw her mom against the wall, all to find out that they're in the wrong apartment. Uh, that is just wrong. And when I saw that three-year-old, I thought of my own daughter who happens to be four years old. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, young people to experience this type of trauma on top of what's going on on a daily basis is just wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think if we just sat back and did nothing, then that mm -hmm. becomes our issue and our, our challenge and our problem. And, you know, myself, along with other members of the council, just said, hey, we really need to dig into this and find out how, where, when, all of those instances so that we can correct the process. And I'm glad that Superintendent Brown, mm -hmm. along with uh, members of the state's attorney and the judiciary, are working with us to better the system. Now, we can't say we want to totally get rid of search warrants. And mm -hmm. search warrants have a place uh, in, in our necessary and specific situations. But we, we hope that in this process that we will develop a better system so that we do not have another Anjanette Young. I don't, we don't have another uh, Daviana. We don't have another Young Mendez. Mm -hmm. That we don't have these types of situations that continue to occur over and over again without any changes to policies, without any changes to procedures to prevent them from happening going forward. You know, that's important. How, um, if you could uh, speak to how do you, does the council, the city council, the alderman, everyone, how do you, are, will you be able to stay in front of and proactively look and identify these things? Because it seems as though when a video is released or something's in the news cycle, then it's reactive. And I know that you all are doing some things that maybe aren't communicated and looking at that, but what's the best approach for the council to be proactive in identifying some of these patterns and um, identifying some stop gaps or some solutions to prevent this from happening? And to your point, I know that the latest incident with uh, Ms. Young, it occurred over a year ago, but um, all the conversation is taking place after the release of it that's public. And so how can we begin to get in front of it and talk about the council's responsibility or some of the things with that and how you're uh, made aware of certain things as they happen, particularly with the police department? Yeah, we as a, as a council have to do a better job of being involved in the city's risk management. Uh, that's one point in the resolution that uh, was presented uh, by the Black Caucus. It talks about that we really need to get into the, you know, roll our sleeves up and get into the details of risk management. Uh, we continue to see similar types of cases continuing to occur. And the question that you ask, you know, has there been any discipline? The answer generally is no. Has there been any changes in procedure? The answer is generally no. And all we get is a bill at the end of the day and the first deputy uh, corporation council member coming to us saying, hey, this is the settlement that we agreed to. We think it's in the city's best interest to settle without dealing with any of the root cause issues. So we think that it's important for us to get in and have these conversations. Uh, the first time when uh, Mayor Lightfoot took office, uh, she hired a risk manager. The city risk management has never been part of any conversations uh, previously. So we think it's important for us as members of the council to be involved in the risk management aspect of what's happening in the city, not just in the police department, but you have similar types of cases uh, of negligence or processes and procedures that you know ultimately hinder our citizens and ultimately end up costing the taxpayers money be it something in the water department, be it something in streets and sanitation, the fire department, and the police department. While the police department is our largest user and our highest uh, area of exposure and liability, there are other departments that if we implemented uh, some basic risk management principles and procedures, 
that that ultimately will save the taxpayers money and also uh, create a better sense of community. I mean, just think about this. If someone comes out to fix a water main and doesn't, you know, restore or repair something properly and you end up tripping and falling over that. Now, here you are as a citizen upset with the city, number one, because we didn't properly service you. Number two, you're injured. So that that costs money. Number three, you lost time from work. That costs money. All of these things that we had to just uh, did something simple as properly restored what was what was torn up by the city and it was our responsibility to do would have a created a better customer relationship with that with that individual and be saved the city a ton of money on the fact that we didn't have the, the litigation the liability and all of those things so it's just some real basic stuff that i think that we as a city need to do and we as members of council need to help drive that process because again we're just getting the bills and we're not having any impact on how these bills look. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, we think that it's necessary mm -hmm. our involvement in the very early stages versus at the late stages. Okay. Thank you for that. I want to go, I have some callers on hold. So I want to go to the line, take a few callers and then we'll continue with our discussion. Caller, you're on the line with Alderman Jason Irving. Hey, 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 my brother. How you doing, uh, brother Irving? This brother Gator. Hey, how you doing, brother? Oh, okay. How you doing, brother Gator? I'm blessed. And you hit the nail on the head. As you know, I've, I've been speaking in front of the budget hearing and uh, and uh, the hearings dealing with with the situation where they don't inform the people of what's happening with within that pinstripe patronage known as the the, the law department. Okay, so. You have the law department that don't let y'all know what's really happening. And I hope y'all get that committee that you're asking for where y'all sitting down and talking with y'all lawyers that's representing you before they make a settlement or whatever because they are paying their friends. I'm going to say I'm gonna say this. I'm going gonna, I'm to leave it alone. The majority of the settlement is damn near a billion dollars. All right? Okay. Y'all didn't pay the lawyers for this, the private lawyer that the city hired. Y'all didn't pay them, I wanted to bet you, more than $50 million to defend cases that they can't win. Okay? Just like that lawyer made a decision to try to stop CBS from putting out that video from a suit that was filed in the federal court in, in uh, 2019, okay? Y'all own it. I'm glad the mayor owned up to it. I'm glad that y'all know now realizing that y'all got to get ahead of it by cleaning up the mess that was left there. You know what I mean? And I'm, I want to in support of what you're doing to help rectify the problems before we can become a major problem. And y'all okay. have the power right now to make it where those police officers got to be held accountable when they break the law, man. They had that woman standing for over 40 minutes, naked. You know what I'm saying? Naked. Okay? Didn't care. They didn't care. And a couple of them officers have been involved and going to the wrong houses or the wrong apartments before. So like you say, it's an ingrained uh, systematic thing that's happening. I just want to say this. I'm supporting y'all leadership, y'all guidance that y'all doing now. And I hope the mayor meet with Miss Y'all. And I hope you can find a way for them to meet with y'all, with, with the Zoom, I have a way that y'all want to do it to make sure that y'all not violating the Open Meetings Act because, and let the people be able to watch what you're doing and we don't have to make a comment as long as we're saying that y'all doing right by trying to right or wrong. And I wanna say I'm glad that you're on the show coming into the beginning of the year and brother Jamil, you're always right on point. And hey, like I, like I say, we as black men, cannot stand for no one 
to do what they do to our women and children and think that there's no consequence. Okay. Brother, I, I want to say to God be the glory. Thank you, brother. Uh, Eddie, thank you very much. Of course, that was Wallace Gator Bradley, known as the Urban Translator. Of course, tune in to the Bradley Report. Brothers always sharing information in the community. So thank you for your call, Gator. And I'll let you comment, brother, if you have a comment, Alderman Urban, before I go to the next caller. Yeah, really, I think one thing that he hit on uh, was very important, that the city spends almost or a little more than what we spend in our total corporation council function we also spend on outside attorneys. Uh, one concern that we've all, we continue to raise is, you know, why should we pay an outside uh, counsel, uh, you know, 200 plus dollars an hour for something that our internal staff uh, can do. So when he talks about the uh, le legal bills and what the lawyers are doing, he's absolutely correct. And again, that's why I think it's important for us as members of the council to be in this conversation on the front end of it versus getting the bill on the back end. And I think that if there's more accountability in the process and these attorneys coming to uh, members of council in a, in a committee format to talk about their case, talk about what's happening, talk about our risk, talk about our exposure, that we uh, should get some different results than what we're getting. And as he said, you know, cut if this is a bad case, hey, we need to pay, let's pay this and move on. Let's not drag a case out a year or two to find out, yeah, we're still going to end up paying, but the meter's been running this whole time. And again, these are taxpayer dollars that ultimately become wasted, dollars that you and I contribute on a daily basis. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll go to the line. Caller, you're on the line with Alderman Jason Irving. Hi, Salam Alaikum. Alaikum Salam, sister. And greetings to your guests. Mm -hmm. I won't be as kind. Um, to suggest that um, the lawyers have to tell you that in advance. You all, as aldermen, can actually ask. If there's a video, ask to see it. You did the same thing with the Laquan McDonald. You signed off on that $5 million, and I consider that to be a total ripoff and disrespect to him. And it's only because Anjanette's um, case has come full circle. This case is almost two years old in February. CBS embarrassed you all with this information. Now you all come all out um, in the community. You're not aware of what's going on in the community? This is old. They've been running that for two years. It's ridiculous. That's just my comment from listening to what you were saying. I want you, if you can, address carjackings in the community, shootings on the expressway, missing females or high-speed chases in the community that oftentimes end with innocent people being killed. And those are, you can take any uh, topic you want. I tell them like them. Start, brother, I want you to, uh, one of the things, the, the carjackings, I'll let you respond to it, but when she goes on the crime, go um, carjackings first, because that's um, been coming up recently a lot. I know with the shootings on the expressway, got to find that balance. I know, I don't know if you all are responsible, but I know the, the, uh, the state troopers are, but your role in that too, but I'll let you respond to the comment and the question. Well, as it relates to the, uh, let's start with the carjackings. Uh, the carjackings are, have become a, a true issue, a true problem. Uh, some people believe that the carjackings are a result of soft prosecution. Uh, some people believe that the carjackings are just a result of people wanting to, uh, I guess, uh, lack of a better term, when I was coming up, people would joyride. But uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a different ball game right now. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, mm -hmm. is in a case where a lot of our young people ha have been misguided and misdirected and mm -hmm. thinking that what they're doing is, is cool or what they're doing is of no consequence because they may see someone else uh, involved in this and not necessarily get the same consequences that would have happened uh, years ago. So there are a myriad of issues around uh, carjackings. Ultimately, mm -hmm. Uh, we do need the response from our uh, criminal justice system uh, to handle these cases. Mm -hmm. Again, joyriding is one thing, but when you take a gun and uh, put it in someone's face and take their items, uh, I don't think that, you know, those situations uh, need to be treated lightly. Um, there's one school of thinking, and I, and I think Chief Judge uh, Tim Evans talks about this, where a lot of our young people, they just have not mentally developed to understand that you, there's no coming back. You don't get another life. 
you don't get you know a third life you can't press the reset button uh if you shoot miss jones and, and take a cadillac uh there is no reset button here on, on what you're seeing on television and things and so sometimes our young people just have not um you know form that that true cognitive ability to truly discern the difference between uh, what they're doing and and its impact and so and that's something that scientifically has been talked about and it's something that the chief judge talks about and that's why we talk about rehabilitation but in some cases you know someone that may be 45 50 years old it says wait a minute these kids know right from wrong and they shouldn't be doing these types of things but again there are two schools of thinking on that uh, at the end of the day, I think that we have to, you know, give our young people uh, opportunities and give them resources and give them uh, ideas and, and guidelines and give them a path to, you know, hey, this is not what you need to be doing. Because I, I don't believe that someone's first crime is is going out, taking a gun and sticking it in someone's face and asking for their car keys or taking their keys or taking their purse. And so we have to do a better job as adults and a better job a, a, as government on trying to work to rehabilitate uh, our, our young people. Uh, as it relates to the uh, shootings on the expressways, um, again, as uh, as Jamil stated, that, that is under the uh, state's jurisdiction is not necessarily an issue uh, for the city of Chicago. However, these incidents are happening uh, on the expressways, on the Eisenhower, on the Dan Ryan, on the Kennedy, you know, in our community, the Bishop Ford. And, and again, uh, and most of the people that are involved in these incidents uh, look like you and I. And I think, I, again, it goes back to, to this thinking that, you know, it, using a gun is, is okay. And again, we, we must impress upon our young people that guns do not solve problems. They tend to create more problems, problems for you as the person shooting the gun, problems for the family of the member that you happen to shoot. And, and again, these are things that we as a community must press upon our young people to talk about. The third issue you talked about, which is, which is an issue of, of missing uh, African-American females. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that uh, my state Senator, uh, Patricia Van Pelt, ha has really been, uh, has taken the bull by the horns on this particular issue uh, to talk about to bring awareness to uh, these missing females. And, and we're working with her uh, and the Chicago Police Department on, you know, chronologically those, uh, that information and trying to, to figure the best approach. And I think that's something that she's uh, taking the lead on. And the final point you talked about was the Anjanette Young case. And, I, and I'll say this, you know, we, we as a, we as aldermen have, have a responsibility, uh, you know, to know everything as it's always is stated. Uh, the reality is that uh, we do not get that information until much later in the process, which is why I think it's necessary for us to get involved in some of this stuff on the front end. Now, the executive branch, the administration knows, well, the police department knew that the moment it happened, but that information in many cases doesn't make it uh, to our side of the of the hall until there's a lawsuit or until something happened or until something is, is brought to us if constituent brings say, hey, this incident happened to me. And then we walk through the process of trying to help, help them write that particular uh, issue. A lot of times we do not get that information. And that's why I said uh, we need to get in, uh, get involved more on the front end uh, with this stuff from a risk management perspective. You talk about, you know, police cars chasing folks, knocking over stuff, people running into stuff. These are all true risk management principles that we need to, you know, just sit down. Is it worth it? And, and have to ask, they have to ask the real hard questions. You know, the guy took a candy bar from 7-Eleven. You know, do we need to be flying down the street at 90 miles an hour trying to chase a guy over a candy bar? You know, these are some serious questions that we have to ask and answer uh, as as members of city council and, and put the necessary policies and procedures in place so that it doesn't happen. And when people violate those policies, adequately discipline them. Because again, two key points in, in all of this, and if you look at this, there, it's a consistent thing. There's generally a lack of supervision, and secondly, there's a lack of discipline. And if you have those two things that aren't functioning properly, you generally tend to have a lot of uh, issues with people just kind of fully doing what they feel is their best decision to do. Mm -hmm. But when you have adequate discipline and adequate supervision, you tend to have less problems. Let me ask you this. When you mention that, we hear about COPA. Now, I know that the aldermen do not necessarily are not notified of things so much down the line. But my understanding is that COPA should be notified 
when a complaint is filed, okay? Well, what is their responsibility? Who do they communicate with? Do, do they notify, is it the executive branch? Is it, uh, do you all have any interaction with COPA? Because for them just now to be looking at the Anjanette Young's case, and it's been going on for so long, then, and I understand there was a staff sh shortage, I understand there was a pandemic, however, the urgency that's associated with their responsibility, that seems like a gap in itself, but talk about your interaction or who do they notify when they receive a case of what's that, what does that entail? So generally COPA, which is, uh, which is the investigative arm that handles uh, police uh, discipline uh, matters. Uh, there are certain cases that COPA mm -hmm. looks at, there are certain cases that the police department looks, looks at. This is a Fourth Amendment case, which is deals with uh, search and seizure. So Fourth Amendment cases are handled by COPA. Generally, what happens is that a, a, a complaint goes into COPA. And traditionally, what you will find is that there is not any interaction with any other agency other than the police department and COPA uh, with a particular case. COPA uh, does its investigate investigation makes a recommendation to the police department for discipline, the police department will either accept it or reject it. And only in cases where uh, termination is, um, is, is sought will the police board get involved. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's take another step back. The city of Chicago, uh, and this is in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, the, generally the police chief or the police superintendent in our case mm -hmm. does not have the power to fire police officers. That power rests with the police board. In some places, for example, uh, I, I, and previously before being an alderman, I was a city manager in the village of Maywood. The village of Maywood has a board of fire and police commissioners whose sole job it is, is to hire and terminate and discipline police officers. The police chief and, and a police superintendent have certain roles, but the role of termination lies with that citizen a board in in our case it's the police board for the city of chicago so the police board are is the ones that actually do the terminating of police officers uh in in any particular case now the case of anjanette young unfortunately what happened in her case was that um she was she was not available for an interview and there was also a second issue that popped up and it was the appropriate use of what's determined to be an override meaning that even if you do not have a signed complaint. Um, again, you need a signed complaint in order to uh, have uh, an investigation brought forward on a police officer. So one of the things that, and this is something that occurred in Springfield, say, hey, if you don't have a signed complaint, then you can't uh, initiate an investigation. This is something that those people on the pro-police side are fall for and receive, but there was also a mechanism where you don't need a complaint if the information is right there in front of you mm -hmm. saying, you know, what happened and you don't necessarily need uh, a signed complaint. And that's called an override. Mm -hmm. And in the case, we found that in, per the inspector general, the police department was not adequately or properly utilizing overrides, meaning that we don't need, Ms. Young, we don't need your complaint because we have a video that mm -hmm. shows exactly what happened. So there was no need to have your, your sign uh, affidavit in this case because we have a video. In the case of a video, then the administrator has has the ability to override the complaint or the affidavit process. Unfortunately, that was not utilized in the Anjanette Young case. Otherwise, the investigation would have been much further along. Now, the COPA did, you know, document the number of times that they reached out to the attorney to, uh, you know, get Miss uh, Anjanette Young's uh, statement and all of those things. And for whatever reason, uh, the attorney did not make her available uh, with uh, for COPA. Mm -hmm. But again, it quite honestly was not necessary because the video gave just about mm -hmm. anything else that she could have given uh, mm -hmm. in her statement or in her conversation. So again, uh, it was we, it's shown that we do not mm -hmm. properly utilize the override as necessary. And that was a report that came out about three weeks ago mm -hmm. from the inspector general, because this case should have been much further along in this process mm 
mm -hmm. uh, than anything. Now that the override is there, now the investigation is picked back up and, and they will continue to go mm -hmm. through the process. Now, what will happen on the other end of this? Uh, we don't know. Uh, a recommendation will come mm -hmm. from the COPA administrator uh, to the superintendent as it relates to discipline. The, the superintendent will either agree or disagree mm -hmm. with what uh, the findings of COPA are. But mm -hmm. currently, those 12 officers that were involved in that incident mm -hmm. currently are no longer uh, on the street there. They've been assigned to administrative uh, mm -hmm. duties, so they will not have any interactions mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with citizens mm -hmm. out on the street mm -hmm. uh, as it stands currently. You know, one of the things, Alderman, thank you for that explanation. I appreciate that, and I'm sure our viewers do as well. One of the things, and I've spoken with a lot of uh, members of law, ex um, of law enforcement and experts, and I know that you all may not do this, but hopefully you can take it and champion it and move it forward in the future, is that the accountability has to go higher. You mentioned that those 12 officers are off the street, but... Uh, is their immediate supervisor or commander held accountable for their actions? Something has to go on that leaders or supervisors file or some kind of accountability to ensure that the training and the oversight really and the accountability is given down to their people. So I know that things are, you know, that, that the, the union, um, the labor agreement, you know, they have is very strong, but to push the accountability up a level to the supervisors as well to make sure if those 12 are off the street then maybe something still has to happen to that supervisor who oversaw those 12 officers and that may be something to help increase the accountability um, of these officers because it's been going on for so long and one time that's inappropriate is too many with the history of of that we have in this city um, when you look at the budgetary impact the impact disproportionately to the community and all of that, we have to find ways to increase that accountability. So I'd love for you to take no, that idea I, and run I with that. I agree with you 100%. Now, of the 12, mm -hmm. one of those individuals was a supervisor that was okay. on the scene. Uh, the policy does require a supervisor, a sergeant, mm -hmm. or hire to be uh, present for the execution of any search warrant. Mm -hmm. And that sergeant that was present uh, on that night in Ms. Young's case has been uh, placed on administrative duty. So mm -hmm. the first level supervision, mm -hmm. of course, is, is there. Um, you know, some of us will argue that there needs to be higher levels of supervision mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. a, a highly, uh, a better skilled team that handles uh, search warrant cases. Um, mm -hmm. in, in other jurisdictions, you find that there is a team. That's what they do. They do search warrants. Right. Uh, it's uh, Chicago, you know, we, we have some challenges when it comes to, to training. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've, I've spoken to officers and they say, well, we, we had search warrant, a search entry training at the academy. Well, if you don't use that training and you end up in a situation mm -hmm. 10, 15 mm -hmm. years later, mm -hmm. we yeah. haven't had the necessary uh, refreshers or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. things of that nature to, to go yeah. with what you did 15 yeah. years ago in the academy. Yeah. So there's definitely some room for improvement mm -hmm. um, in, in that area. Mm -hmm. And there's also room to say, hey, let's look at potentially yeah. having an area-wide uh, search warrant team that yeah. this is what they do. This is all that they do. So they understand yeah. the types of situations you may run into. This is mm -hmm. what you do. If you encounter a situation where you have an unclothed individual, right. this is what you do when you, you encounter yeah. these different types of situations, yeah. because we have 22 districts in the city and there are potentially 22 different ways that search warrants are being executed right. in the city. And, and, and again, there yeah. needs to be some standardization. And these are items that we yeah. pressed the superintendent on. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, uh, you know, he will answer the call mm -hmm. and, and bring the standardization that's needed and yeah. give the proper level of supervision. The yeah. fact that there was not even a woman on that team, you well, know, these are some serious it, concerns it, it, that the woman had to wait 40 yeah, some odd minutes for it, a woman to even show up. Yeah, and, so and it's serious. It, and, that type of stuff. And, and we can get in the train, but I will say this respectfully that um, there is no way that I that I could believe that they will let, if that, if Miss Anjanek Young was a Caucasian woman, she wouldn't have stood up there naked for all that time. And regardless of training, that's my personal opinion. But I, I, and, I, and I agree no with you. And here's the other challenge right. is that yeah. the diversity amongst our members mm -hmm. of our of our tax teams in our districts. 
the fact that we that we do not have African American officers or supervisors in some of these positions. When you look at that video, you do not see one right. black or brown officer mm -hmm. in that video at all. And right. I think that had you found someone there, they may have taken a slightly different approach to to be a little more sensitive about the fact that you have yes. a, a woman, mm -hmm. uh, a black female standing there with no clothes on. That's a problem right. that we hey we need to fix this. Right. You know before jumping through not understand coming in the home mm -hmm. securing the scene but after you secure the scene and find that yeah. everything is secure now we can get some you know figure something mm -hmm. out and having her stand there all that time unclothed is just wrong it, it and, is and it I is that someone else different community different re reaction mm -hmm. and it's incumbent upon us to work to fix that Yes, sir. Hey, I know we're running out of time, but I want to get at least a caller in for a quick oh, I'm sorry, to come in. No, no, that's not you. Uh, caller, you're on the line. Assalamualaikum. Lake Salaam, brother. I just saw on the news that there's been a flurry of emails being released about what has occurred with uh, regards to this incident with the, with the sister. And uh, suggesting that the, the mayor knew uh, much more than she uh, says that she uh, new. Yes, so uh, I'm hoping that she uh, can uh, kind of fix this with uh, some clarity and honesty uh, so that she doesn't, it doesn't look to be uh, her Laquan McDonald or something like that. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Brother Emmanuel. And that's true. A lot of things have gone in. As you stated, I know the systematic things of what's communicated with the executive branch. We'll go to this last caller. Caller, you have a quick question or comment? Hello? Yes. Yeah, this is Shia. I want to know on these warrants that the police get, why is it that a warrant can be issued and they don't have no surveillance on the house for at least a week or two? That is, the person who they're after, they can see this person going in and out of this house instead of just okay. getting a warrant on somebody's word say, well, Joe Blow lives here. I okay. mean, it seems like they would oh. have somebody watching oh. the house for at least a week to make sure that this person lives in this house. And All they right, wouldn't brother. have these problems. All right, brother. Thank okay. you. We we'll go to Alderman. Can you answer that, or I mean, well, that's the that's one of the issues that that concerns us. That uh, these uh, John Doe uh, or paid informants that are in many cases in 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 hock themselves, saying, "Hey, well, Tone, he got he got a three fifty seven under the mattress at the house," and you know, then they go running into a judge to say, "We need a warrant because Tone said he got a three fifty seven. Nobody seen Tone. They don't know Tone locked up." You know, it's just too much misinformation in this process that has not been vetted mm -hmm. to see because, hey, when I come in my house, I don't expect anybody to be coming in, knocking at my, knocking my door down, coming in right. here. You know, I'm, I'm going to have a different type of conversation for them and maybe something else for them mm -hmm. coming in here. So when we violate that sanctity of the home, this is one of the few places that you have that's yours. Right. And, and to violate that sanctity just because somebody says something without any corroborating information is just wrong. And that's something that the police department must change, not allow these paid informants to give them anything so they can get out of their situation and then turn around. And, and here we are looking at a multimillion dollar situation just because somebody said somebody had a gun. We're talking right. about one gun that they're going in with all of this force to look for right. one gun. I thought they were looking for, you know, a tank or something, the way they hit that, that lady's house. Yeah. But for one gun, that's, that's a problem. It, it was, brother. I, I appreciate you coming on. I know if you have any of your constituents that want to contact you, uh, that email address is info at aldermanirvin.com. Yeah, info at aldermanirvin.com. Our telephone number is 773-533-0900 is our telephone number. Uh, we're there we have you know we don't have walk-ins right now because of covid yes, but if you give us a phone call if we don't answer we will call you back mm -hmm. send us an email we will respond so no but thank you for uh having having me on uh, this time went by so fast yes, uh, hey, you know, well, what that just means you got to come back again brother <laughs> yeah, so you know, i don't have a, have a problem with that you know i appreciate everything that that you have, have done uh, i've known you for for a while you've always been good upstanding and, and helpful uh, to people in our community. So I just want to thank you for everything that you have done and what you continue to do uh, for us on the south and west sides of Chicago. Thank you very much, brother. We'll um, bring you back again soon. There's much more to talk about. And for those, right. those of you in our viewing audience, thank you so much for viewing. I leave you in the greetings of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum.